Chapter 17 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 17 on the twenty fourth of october according to my computation in a dark night i came to a river which appeared to be both broad and deep sounding its depth with a pole i found it too deep to be forded and after the most careful search along the shore no boat could be discovered this place appeared altogether strange to me and i began to fear that i was again lost confident that i had never before been where i now found myself and ignorant of the other side of the stream i thought it best not to attempt to cross this water until i was better informed of the country through which it flowed a thick wood bordered the road on my left and gave me shelter until daylight ascending a tree at sunrise that overlooked the stream which appeared to be more than a mile in width I perceived on the opposite shore a house, and one large and several small boats in the river. I remained in this tree the greater part of the day, and saw several persons cross the river, some of whom had horses, but in the evening the boats were all taken back to the place at which I had seen them in the morning. The river was so broad that I felt some fear of failing in the attempt to swim it, but seeing no prospect of procuring a boat to transport me i resolved to attempt the navigation as soon as it was dark about nine o'clock at night having equipped myself in the best manner i was able i undertook this hazardous navigation and succeeded in gaining the farther shore of the river in about an hour with all my things in safety on the previous day i had noted the bearing of the road as it led from the river and in the middle of the night i again resumed my journey in a state of perplexity bordering upon desperation for it was now evident that this was not the road by which we had travelled when we came to the southern country and on which hand to turn to reach the right way i knew not after travelling five or six miles on this road and having the north star in view all the time I became satisfied that my course lay northwest, and that I was consequently going out of my way. And to heighten my anxiety, I had not tasted any animal food since I crossed the Savannah River. A sensation of hunger harassed me constantly. But fortune, which had been so long adverse to me, and had led me so often astray, had now a little favor in store for me. The leaves were already fallen from some of the more tender trees, and near the road this night I perceived a persimmon tree, well laden with fruit, and whilst gathering the fallen persimmons under the tree, a noise overhead arrested my attention. This noise was caused by a large opossum, which was on the tree gathering fruit like myself. With a long stick the animal was brought to the ground, and it proved to be very fat, weighing at least ten pounds. With such a luxury as this in my possession, I could not think of travelling far without tasting it, and accordingly halted about a mile from the persimmon tree, on a rising ground in a thick wood, where I killed my opossum and took off its skin, a circumstance that I much regretted, for with the skin I took at least a pound of fine fat, had I possessed the means of scalding my game and dressing it like a pig, it would have afforded me provision for a week. But as it was, I made a large fire and roasted my prize before it, losing all the oil that ran out in the operation for want of a dripping pan to catch it. It was daylight when my meat was ready for the table, and a very sumptuous breakfast it yielded me. Since leaving Columbia, I had followed as nearly as the course of the roads permitted the index of the North Star, which I supposed would lead me on the most direct route to Maryland. But I now became convinced that this star was leading me away from the line by which I had approached the cotton country. I slept none this day, but passed the whole time, from breakfast until night, 
in considering the means of regaining my lost way. From the aspect of the country I arrived at the conclusion that I was not near the sea-coast, for there were no swamps at all in this region. The land lay rather high and rolling, and oak timber abounded. At the return of night I resumed my journey earlier than usual, paying no regard to the roads, but keeping the North Star on my left hand as nearly as I could. This night I killed a rabbit, which had leaped from the bushes before me, by throwing my walking-stick at it. It was roasted at my stopping-place in the morning, and was very good. I pursued the same course, keeping the North Star on my left hand for three nights, intending to get as far east as the road leading from Columbia to Richmond in Virginia, but as my line of march lay almost continually in the woods, I made but little progress, and on the third day the weather became cloudy so that I could not see the stars. This again compelled me to lie by until the return of fair weather. On the second day, after I had stopped this time, the sun shone out bright in the morning, and continued to shed a glorious light during the day but in the evening the heavens became overcast with clouds, and the night that followed was so dark that I did not attempt to travel. This state of the weather continued more than a week, obliging me to remain stationary all this time. These cloudy nights were succeeded by a brisk wind from the northwest, accompanied by fine clear nights, in which I made the best of my way towards the northeast, pursuing my course across the country, without regard to roads, forests, or streams of water, crossing many of the latter, none of which were deep, but some of them were extremely muddy. One night I became entangled in a thick and deep swamp, the trees that grew in which were so tall and stood so close together, that the interlocking of their boughs, and the deep foliage in which they were clad, prevented me from seeing the stars, Wandering there for several hours, most of the time with mud and water over my knees, and frequently wading in stagnant pools with deep slimy bottoms, I became totally lost, and was incapable of seeing the least appearance of fast land. At length, giving up all hope of extricating myself from this abyss of mud, water, brambles, and fallen timber, I scrambled on a large tussock, and sat down to await the coming of day with the intention of going to the nearest high land as soon as the sun should be up. The nights were now becoming cool, and though I did not see any frost in the swamp where I was in the morning, I have no doubt that hoar-frost was seen in the dry and open country. After daylight I found myself as much perplexed as I was at midnight. No shore was to be seen, and in every direction there was the same deep, dreary, black solitude. To add to my misfortune, the morning proved cloudy, and when the sun was up I could not tell the east from the west. After waiting several hours for a sight of the sun, and failing to obtain it, I set out in search of a running stream of water, intending to strike off at right angles with the course of the current, and endeavor to reach the dry ground by this means. But after wandering about, through tangled bushes, briars, and vines, clambering over fallen tree-tops, and wading through fens overgrown with saw-grass, for two or three hours, I sat down in despair of finding any guide to conduct me from this detestable place. My bag of meal that I took with me at the commencement of my journey was long since gone, and the only provisions that I now possessed were a few grains of parched corn, and near a pint of chestnuts that I had picked up under a tree the day before I entered the swamp. The chestnut tree was full of nuts, but I was afraid to throw sticks or to shake the tree, lest hunters or other persons hearing the noise might be drawn to the place. About ten o'clock I sat down under a large cypress tree, upon a decaying log of the same timber, to make my breakfast on a few grains of parched corn. Near me was an open space without trees, but filled with water that seemed to be deep, for no grass grew in it, except a small quantity near the shore. The water was on my left hand, and as I sat cracking my corn, my attention was attracted by the playful gambols of two squirrels, 
that were running and chasing each other on the boughs of some trees near me. Half pleased with the joyous movements of the little animals, and half covetous of their carcasses to roast and devour them, I paid no attention to a succession of sounds on my left, which I thought proceeded from the movement of frogs at the edge of the water, until the breaking of a stick near me caused me to turn my head, when I discovered that I had other neighbors than spring frogs. A monstrous alligator had left the water and was crawling over the mud with his eyes fixed upon me. He was now within fifteen feet of me, and in a moment more, if he had not broken the stick with his weight, I should have become his prey. He could easily have knocked me down with a blow of his tail, and if his jaws had once been closed on a leg or an arm, he would have dragged me into the water, spite of any resistance that I could have made. At the sight of him I sprang to my feet, and running to the other end of the fallen tree on which I sat, and being there out of danger, had an opportunity of viewing the motions of the alligator at leisure. Finding me out of his reach, he raised his trunk from the ground, elevated his snout, and gave a wistful look, the import of which I well understood. Then, turning slowly round, he retreated to the water, and sank from my vision. I was much alarmed by this adventure with the alligator, for had I fallen in with this huge reptile in the night-time, I should have had no chance of escape from his tusks. The whole day was spent in the swamp, not in travelling from place to place, but in waiting for the sun to shine, to enable me to obtain a knowledge of the various points of the heavens. The day was succeeded by a night of unbroken darkness, and it was late in the evening of the second day before I saw the sun. It being then too late to attempt to extricate myself from the swamp for that day, I was obliged to pass another night in the lodge that I had formed for myself in the thick boughs of a fallen cypress tree, which elevated me several feet from the ground, where I believed the alligator could not reach me if he should come in pursuit of me. On the morning of the third day the sun rose beautifully clear, and at sight of him I set off for the east. It must have been five miles from the place where I lay to the dry land on the east of the swamp, for with all the exertion that fear and hunger compelled me to make, it was two or three o'clock in the afternoon when I reached the shore, after swimming in several places, and suffering the loss of a very valuable part of my clothes, which were torn off by the briars and snags. On coming to high ground I found myself in the woods, and hungry as I was, lay down to await the coming of night, lest someone should see me moving through the forest in daylight. When night came on I resumed my journey by the stars, which were visible, and marched several miles before coming to a plantation. The first that I came to was a cotton field, and after much search I found no corn nor grain of any kind on this place, and was compelled to continue on my way. Two or three miles further on I was more fortunate, and found a field of corn which had been gathered from the stalks and thrown in heaps along the ground. Filling my little bag, which I still kept, with this corn, I retreated a mile or two in the woods, and striking fire, encamped for the purpose of parching and eating it. After dispatching my meal, I lay down beside the fire, and fell into a sound sleep, from which I did not awake until long after sunrise. But on rising and looking around me, I found that my lodge was within less than a hundred yards of a new house that people were building in the woods, and upon which men were now at work. Dropping instantly to the ground, I crawled away through the woods, until, being out of sight of the house, I ventured to rise and escape on my feet. After I lay down in the night, my fire had died away, and emitted no smoke. This circumstance had saved me. This affair made me more cautious as to my future conduct. Hiding in the woods until night again came on, I continued my course eastward, and some time after midnight came upon a wide, well-beaten road, one end of which led, at this place, a little to the left of the North Star, which I could plainly see. Here I deliberated a long time, whether to take this road, or continue my course across the country by the stars, but at last resolved to follow the road, 
more from a desire to get out of the woods than from a conviction that it would lead me in the right way. In the course of this night I saw but few plantations, but was so fortunate as to see a groundhog crossing the road before me. This animal I killed with my stick, and carried it until morning. At the approach of daylight, turning away to the right, I gained the top of an eminence from which I could see through the woods for some distance around me. Here I kindled a fire and roasted my groundhog, which afforded me a most grateful repast after my late fasting and severe toils. According to custom, my meal being over, I betook myself to sleep, and did not awake until the afternoon, when descending a few rods down the hill, and standing still to take a survey of the woods around me, I saw, at the distance of half a mile from me, a man moving about in the forest, and apparently watching like myself to see if any one was in view. Looking at this man attentively, I saw that he was a black, and that he did not move more than a few rods from the same spot where I first saw him. Curiosity impelled me to know more of the condition of my neighbor, and descending quite to the foot of the hill, I perceived that he had a covert of boughs of trees, under which I saw him pass, and after some time return again from his retreat. Examining the appearance of things carefully, I became satisfied that the stranger was, like myself, a negro slave, and I determined without more ceremony to go and speak to him, for I felt no fear of being betrayed by one as badly off in the world as myself. When this man first saw me, at the distance of a hundred yards from him, he manifested great agitation, and at once seemed disposed to run from me. But when I called to him, and told him not to be afraid, he became more assured, and waited for me to come close to him. I found him to be a dark mulatto, small and slender in person, and lame in one leg. He had been well-bred, and possessed good manners and fine address. I told him I was travelling, and presumed this was not his dwelling-place, upon which he informed me that he was a native of Kent County in the state of Delaware, and had been brought up as a house-servant by his master, who, on his deathbed had made a will and directed him to be set free by his executors at the age of twenty-five, and that in the meantime he would be hired out as a servant to some person who should treat him well. Soon after the death of his master, the executors hired him to a man in Wilmington, who employed him as a waiter in his house for three or four months, and then took him to a small town called Newport, and sold him, to a man who took him immediately to Baltimore, where he was again sold, or transferred, to another man, who brought him to South Carolina, and sold him, to a cotton planter, with whom he had lived more than two years, and had run away three weeks before the time I saw him, with the intention of returning to Delaware. That being lame, and becoming fatigued by travelling, he had stopped here and made this shelter of boughs and bark of trees, under which he had remained more than a week before I met him. He invited me to go into his camp, as he termed it, where he had an old skillet, more than a bushel of potatoes, and several fowls, all of which he said he had purloined from the plantations in the neighbourhood. This encampment was in a level open wood, and it appeared surprising to me that its occupant had not been discovered and conveyed back to his master before this time. I told him that I thought he ran great risk of being taken up by remaining here, and advised him to break up his lodge immediately and pursue his journey, travelling only in the night-time. He then proposed to join me, and travel in company with me. But this I declined, because of his lameness and his great want of discretion, though I did not assign these reasons to him. I remained with this man two or three hours, and ate dinner of fowls dressed after his rude fashion. Before leaving him, I pressed upon him the necessity of immediately quitting the position he then occupied, but he said he intended to remain there a few days longer, unless I would take him with me. On quitting my new acquaintance, I thought it prudent to change my place of abode for the residue of this day, and removed along the top of the hill that I occupied at least two miles, and concealed myself in a thicket until night, 
Then, returning to the road I had left in the morning, and traveling hard all night, I came to a large stream of water just at the break of day. As it was too late to pass the river with safety this morning at the ford, I went half a mile higher, and swam across the stream in open daylight, at a place where both sides of the water were skirted with woods. I had several large potatoes that had been given to me by the man at his camp in the woods, and these constituted my rations for the day. At the rising and setting of the sun I took the bearing of the road by the course of the stream that I had crossed, and found that I was travelling to the northwest instead of the north or northeast, to one of which latter points I wished to direct my march. Having perceived the country in which I now was to be thickly peopled, I remained in my resting place until late at night, when returning to the road and crossing it, I took once more to the woods, with the stars for my guides, and steered for the northeast. This was a fortunate night for me in all respects. The atmosphere was clear, the ground was high, dry, and free from thickets. In the course of the night I passed several cornfields, with the corn still remaining in them, and passed a potato lot in which large quantities of fine potatoes were dug out of the ground and lay in heaps covered with vines. But my most signal good luck occurred just before day, when passing under a dogwood tree and hearing a noise in the branches above me, I looked up and saw a large opossum amongst the berries that hung upon the boughs. The game was quickly shaken down, and turned out as fat as a well-fed pig, and as heavy as a full-grown raccoon. My attention was now turned to searching for a place in which I could secrete myself for the day, and dress my provisions in quietness. This day was clear and beautiful, until the afternoon, when the air became damp, and the heavens were overhung with clouds. The night that followed was dark as pitch, compelling me to remain in my camp all night. The next day brought with it a terrible storm of rain and wind, that continued with but little intermission more than twenty-four hours, and the sun was not again visible until the third day, nor was there a clear night for more than a week. During all this time I lay in my camp, and subsisted upon the provisions that I had brought with me to this place. The corn and potatoes looked so tempting, when I saw them in the fields, that I had taken more than I should have consumed, had not the bad weather compelled me to remain at this spot. But it was well for me for this time that I had taken more than I could eat in one or two days. At the end of the cloudy weather I felt much refreshed and strengthened, and resumed my journey in high spirits, although I now began to feel the want of shoes, those which I wore when I left my mistress having long since been worn out, and my boots were wrapped strips of hickory bark about my feet to keep the leather from separating and falling to pieces. It was now by my computation the month of November, and I was yet in the state of South Carolina. I began to consider with myself whether I had gained or lost by attempting to travel on the roads, and after revolving in my mind all of the disasters that had befallen me, determined to abandon the roads altogether for two reasons, the first of which was that on the highways I was constantly liable to meet persons or to be overtaken by them, and a second, no less powerful, was that as I did not know what roads to pursue, I was oftener travelling on the wrong route than on the right one. Setting my face once more for the North Star, I advanced with a steady though slow pace for four or five nights when I was again delayed by dark weather, and forced to remain in idleness nearly two weeks, and when the weather again became clear, I was arrested on the second night by a broad and rapid river, that appeared so formidable that I did not dare to attempt its passage until after examining it in daylight. On the succeeding night, however, I crossed it by swimming, resting at some large rocks near the middle. After gaining the north side of this river, which I believed to be the Catawba, I considered myself in North Carolina, and again steered towards the north. End of chapter 17